to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel 13, verse 14, that God was seeking a man after his own heart. And we learn in the Bible that that was King David. We welcome you to our series of Old Testament studies as we think today about David, King David, as a man after God's own heart. As always, we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. We encourage you to visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a wide variety of video and audio lessons that you can access there, as well as a lot of good Bible study resources that would be helpful in your study of the Word of God. We encourage you as well to visit the Lord's Church in your area. The Church of Christ there would love for you to stop by and visit with them. If you've got a Bible question, would like to have a Bible study or know more about the church, they'd be happy to sit down and discuss that matter with you. And at the Gospel of Christ, we'd be happy to help you as well in your study of God's Word in whatever way that we can. You can email us or call us or write to us. We'd be happy to help you in your searching of the Scriptures. Today, we're going to be thinking about one of the great men of the Old Testament, one of the great kings in the Old Testament, King David. David is looked up to by many in the nation of Israel still today and very many Bible students as well. What is it that made David such a great king and, and why do we relate to him so well today? These are questions that we'll consider in our study of the Old Testament lessons today. As you think about King David, he is held up high in esteem by many because he was a man after God's own heart. I want you to listen to 1 Samuel chapter 13 and notice what the Bible says in verse number 14. God speaking to Saul, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. We read in 1 Samuel 16 verse 7 and in Acts 13 verse 22 that God was actually speaking about the one who would replace King Saul, King David. David was a man after God's own heart. David wanted to do what was right, prove all things. Hold fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. And David was a man, although he made mistakes, although he was not perfect, David tried to pattern his life after the holiness of God. Leviticus 11, verse 44, and quoted in the New Testament by Peter, in 1 Peter, verse 15, the Bible says, But as he who called you is holy, be holy in all your conduct. Be perfect, for I am perfect, or complete, for I am complete, Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse number 48. And so when you think about the life of David, he's a man who tried to pattern himself after God, to live a life of holiness, which the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 14, without holiness, no one can see God, to live and to act and to think like God and the Lord Jesus Christ thinks is the motto for every Christian, to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. 1 Peter 2, verse 21, to follow that great example who was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 15. David tried to make his ways like God's ways. Although we're not like God, Isaiah 55, verse number 7 and verse number 11, God says, my ways are, are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. We try to attain and to achieve that level of holiness in our lives. David was a man after God's own heart because he tried to live according to the Word and the will of God. And friend, Christians must do 
the same thing today. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I want God's commands and God's word to guide and to guard my life in every way. You see, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 13 that it's not in words which human wisdom speaks, but which the Holy Spirit speaks. That's what ought to guide and what we ought to live our life by. And thus, like the noble Bereans, in Acts 17, verse 11, we want to search God's scriptures daily to see if what we're doing is true to the will of Almighty God. And so when you think about David as a great king, as a, a pattern to follow, he tried to have the heart of God to think, to act, and to live as God would want him to live in every day. And friend, isn't that what we ought to do as well? While we're not perfect, while like David, we make mistakes, we want God to be on the forefront of what we think and the way we act and how we live our life. We want to ask ourselves, what would God have us to do in these situations? Then as you think about David as a man after God's own heart, David also had the courage to conquer the giants in his life. Very likely, if you've studied much of the Old Testament, you've studied 1 Samuel 17 and where David there battles Goliath. You remember the scene and the setting. His brothers are out at war. David really isn't old enough or strong enough, they think, or big enough to go to battle. And in this battle against the, against the Gentiles, there is a giant by the name of Goliath, and everybody's afraid of him. At morning and at night, he taunts the people of God and makes fun of them, as it were, and, and everybody shakes in their boots when Goliath does that. David goes out to visit his brothers, and he hears this giant taunting Israel and taunting God, and David says, basically, I'm not going to put up with it. So he takes some armor, and the armor doesn't even fit. And so he goes out to battle this great giant with a slingshot, basically, and five smooth stones. He takes that slingshot, you remember? sends one of those rocks right into the head of, of the giant, and he falls dead there. David takes the sword and cuts off his head. How could a little boy, as it were, how could a, someone who's not even in the military do something like that? And of course, we realize David did that with the help of Almighty God. He had the courage, first of all, to go out there and to face the giant, Goliath. And friend, as I think about my life and as I think about, as we think about our lives, let's realize if we're going to pattern our lives after David, we've got to have the courage to face those spiritual or physical giants in our lives. Of course, the greatest giant, the enemy of all that every one of us has to face every day is Satan. We need the courage of David with God's help and by the blood of Christ to face the devil every day. No doubt he's a fearsome enemy. Like Goliath, the Bible describes him in 1 Peter 5, 8. It says, be sober, be, be vigilant, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The devil is a, a, a fearful adversary, just as Goliath was. But I need the courage, and with God's help, to face him and to overcome him every day. And friend, the good news is that you can overcome the devil. The Bible says in 1 John 4, verse 4, He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Well, who's in the world? The devil is the prince of the world. John chapter 8, he's described with, as the God of this world, as it were. He who is in Christians is greater than he who is in the world. And the Bible tells us why in 1 John 5 verse 4. This is the victory we have, even our faith. And so, yes, we can defeat the devil. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 57 says, Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And right before that, Paul says, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we think about, about what God does through us. We think about the power that we have and, and, and how God works victoriously in His children. And friend, in, in view of that, we don't need to cower or terror in the face of Satan and temptation. We need the boldness to approach every day 
with God's help, God's grace, and God's mercy. We can cast all our cares upon God. He cares for us. You see, the devil has already been defeated. Jesus, through death, overcame him by the power of death and released those who all their lifetime were subject to bondage. Jesus dealt, as it were, that, that death blow. Romans 16, verse 20, Genesis 3, 15, to Satan on the cross. And if I'm living in Christ and I'm trying to walk in the light, 1 John 1, verse 7, then friend, like Goliath, there is nothing that is impossible with God and His children. And so we want the courage of David in our lives as we face the giants, whatever that giant may be. It may not physically be Satan. It may be temptation. It may be disease. It may be sickness. It may be struggles or calamities that we face in this life. But let's realize the one who is in us is greater than anything else. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 4. Then as you think about the life of David, as a man after God's own heart, not only did David have the courage to conquer uh, the giants in his life, David also knew how to deal with his enemies. There were enemies in the life of King David. One of the greatest of those was Saul, who should have been the king that God chose, the king that the people asked for, who should have been doing God's will, but he went astray. Saul began to do things his own way. He began to walk by uh, his own pattern of life, and, and God eventually will remove him as king. But Saul is jealous of David. Saul's jealous of his battles, his fame, the fact that God is now working through him. And so on various occasions, Saul tries to kill David tries to quieten him, tries to again get the people to follow after him. And yet David never really acted out in his own vengeance. David would always put his trust in God. He would even go as far as honoring the position that King Saul held. And he would always let God be the one to take vengeance. And friend, as you think about your life, as I think about mine, we've got to realize that if we're going to be people after God's own heart, then we need to know how to deal with our enemies as well. There are enemies probably in everybody's life. We don't want them. We don't ask for them. But sometimes that happens. How do you deal with situations where somebody is opposed to good or opposed to the way you live or opposed to Christianity? Well, friend, the Bible gives us advice on that. I want to share with you two passages that I think really offer support for the Christian in times like these. The first is found in Romans chapter 12, verse number 20. God says, Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, you'll heap coals of fire on his head. And so when we think about how should the Christian respond to an enemy, to someone who's taken an adversarial position to God or Christ or the way we live or our morals, friend, we don't act out in vengeance. We're not going to take up arms and try to defeat them. We're not going to get ugly or mean with them. We do good. We try to help. We try to show the love of God in Christ in every way. Listen to what the Lord said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 and 45, as it relates to one's enemies. Jesus said it this way, But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for He makes His sun rise on the evil and on the just, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. When you think about David, how he didn't act out in vengeance, how he put his trust in God, how he let God take care of the situation. Friend, as it relates to us, we want to do good. We want to bless and not curse. We want to pray for. We want to help. We're not trying to make the situation more difficult. We're letting God work through us. And hopefully, by those actions, we soften people's hearts. We help them to see that we're really not their enemy. And more than anything, the love, compassion, and mercy of God can be shown through our lives. As you think about principles in David's life that we can follow, let's also really realize that as a man after God's own heart, David, he learned how to respect the authority of God's Word. In 2 Samuel 6, there's a very interesting scene. 
the people of God have now returned to take the ark of God back. The enemies didn't want it because it kept cursing them, and so they're going to give it to them to bring the ark of God back to the people of God. But they do things a little odd there. They take a new cart, the Bible says. They place that ark on the cart, and as they're entering a section of the land or road called Nashon's threshing floor, uh, the cart, as it were, hits a pothole we might think of. And two men are on each side of it, as it were. Uzzah and Ahio are their names. And as the cart looks like it's going to, the ark looks like it's going to fall, uh, Uzzah reaches out to touch and to stabilize the ark of God. He drops dead right there on the spot. And David doesn't know what to do. The text tells us he gets a little angry about it even. And so David has to go home and think about this, as it were, and figure out what did we do wrong? What was the problem here? And friend, it was a basic problem of not respecting the authority of God's Word. What do we mean by that? If you got your Bible, I want you to direct your attention to 1 Chronicles chapter 15, and uh, let's get the rest of the story as it relates to this event. First Chronicles 15, I want you to look at what the Bible says in verses 13 through 15, commenting on this exact event of bringing the ark of God back. Here's what David later said, For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us, now don't miss this, because we did not consult him about the proper order. So the priest and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel, and the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles, notice now, as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. You read the book of Numbers and you read God's intricate details about transporting the ark, and there was one approved way to do that. The Levites were the only people who could do it, and then a certain family in the Levites, the Kohathites, were the ones who had permission to transport it. Nobody ever touched the ark. They put two poles through rings in its side, and the poles touched the arks of four men as they carried that ark. And so when you think about this transportation of the ark, they did it all wrong in 2 Samuel 6. No one was to ever touch it. They didn't have permission to put it on a new cart. And when Uzzah touched that ark and died, friend, that was because nobody respected the authority of God's Word. No, God said, David said it happened because we didn't consult God about the proper order. David learned a hard lesson about respecting the authority of God and His Word. And friend, how we can learn from David's example today. We need to respect the voice and the authority of God. When God tells us how He wants things to be done, we learn from David that that's exactly what God wants us to do. Colossians 3 verse 17 says, Whatever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of or by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture says in Revelation 22 verses 18 and 19 that we're not to add to nor take away from the things written in the book. We're only to do what God tells us. Proverbs 30 verse 6 in the long ago, the wise proverb writer said, do not add to his word lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. And how we need to listen to the encouragement of 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6. We're not to go beyond what is written. When God tells us how to live our life, friend, that's exactly how God wants us to live it. When God tells us how we're to honor Him and worship Him today, that's exactly how God wants us to do that. There's no sense in trying to bring things in on the proverbial new card, as it were. When God's already dictated in the Bible how to live, how to worship, how to pray, how a person needs to be saved, we need to learn from David that if we want to please God, we need to ask God how He wants to be pleased. And of course, the answer is found in His divine will. Then, friend, as we think about David as a man after God's own heart, let's also realize that David was a man, after a man after God's own heart, one that we can learn from, David was big enough to confess and repent of sin when he found it in his life. 
You're probably familiar with the story. 2 Samuel 11 and 12. David, at a time when kings ought to have been out at war, he's up on the rooftop, and you remember he sees beautiful Bathsheba bathing. And sin takes over his heart. He lusts after her. He desires to have her. He takes her and has sexual relations with her. Eventually, she becomes pregnant. Her husband is also in David's army, and they don't know what to do about that situation. So they try to first send him home from the battle to have relations with his wife. So they'll think it's his kid. When that doesn't work, they send him to the forefront in the battle. They draw back from him and he's ultimately killed in battle. So you've got adultery, you've got lying, you've got cheating, you've got murder. All those things occurred because David let sin reign in his heart. As you remember, Nathan the prophet eventually comes to David with that sad story about the one little ewe lamb and, and how some traveler came to town and uh, wouldn't take of his own, but he took from the man's one ewe lamb and how, how that broke David's heart. And he said, whoever the man is, bring him here. He's going to pay for that. And Nathan looked at him and said, you're the man. You're the one who had plenty of others. You're the one who had wives you could have taken from and you took this one man's wife that he loved. In essence, we're talking about you. You're the man. What did David do? when, As king of Israel, the most powerful man in all the world, what did he do? He said, you're right. I've sinned. David was big enough to confess and to repent of his sin. Friend, there's a man after God's own heart. Someone who when they see sin in their life is willing to change. We need that same attitude today. If we walk, the Bible says this in 1 John 1, verses 7 through 10. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, that's good. We've got fellowship one with another, and the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we make God a liar and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all iniquity. Simon in Acts chapter 8 serves as an example of this. Simon sinned after obeying the gospel. Peter approached him and said, your heart's not right in the sight of God. You have neither part nor portion in this matter. I see that you're in the bond of iniquity, the gall of bitterness. And Simon said, pray for me, that none of the things that you've said will come upon me. Our Lord said in Luke 13, 3, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Peter preached in Acts 3, verse 19, Repent and turn, that your sins may be blotted out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Sometimes I think today that if someone confesses and acknowledges and, and repents of sin, we look at that and we say, Well, boy, they've really messed up. They were really a bad person. Shame on them. That's not God's heart. The heart of God is one who is big enough to confess and repent of that sin and get his life back right with Almighty God. Then, friend, we learn a very powerful lesson from the life of David as well on how to deal with death. David was not immune to heartache and heartbreak that came into his life. Much of it was due to the sin and the results of what happened with Bathsheba. And God promised that would happen. The son who was born to that adulterous relationship doesn't last. The Bible records that that son actually dies. And David makes, some pretty powerful, uh, makes a pretty powerful statement about death and life and, and things related to that. And I want you to listen to it in 2 Samuel chapter 12. I want you to hear what David says. It teaches us a great lesson about how to deal with life and death and matters that are extremely important. The Bible says this in 2 Samuel 12. Verse 22, the servants come to David. They question him about his, uh, his demeanor. He said in verse 22, While the child was alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back? Listen to this statement. I shall go to him. He shall not return to me. When, when you think about death, and you think about how to look at that. David did have the proper attitude here. David realized, he's not coming back to me. I can't revive him. I can't bring him back. One day, I'll go to him. 
And as we think about life and as we think about maybe the death of, of loved ones who are close to us, let's realize the hope that we live with in, in view of their loss, in our loss, in view of their death, the hope that we live with is this. One day we can go to them. One day we will be reunited in Christ. All in the graves will one day come forth. John 5, verse 28 and 29. The, the dead in Christ will meet Him in the air with, their, with our loved ones. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. And so, although we can't change the fact that, that every person's life ends in death, the good news is that's not really the end. Jesus said in John 11, verse 24 and 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, he'll never really die. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Revelation 14, verse 13, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Psalm 116, verse 15. And as Paul said, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Friend, we ask you to think soberly and to think seriously about life and about whether we're a people, whether I'm a person who's following the heart of God. Are you like David? What a great king he was. Although he wasn't perfect, he tried to pattern his life after the heart and the mind of God. Are we doing that today? Friend, if you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's how you get your heart in line with the heart of God. Have you heard the message about Christ? Romans 10 verse 17. Do you believe that Jesus really is the Savior of the world? John 8, verse 24. Would you be willing to repent of things in your life that are not right? Luke 13, verse 3. Confessing the beautiful name of Jesus, Romans 10, verse 10. Would you do what Jesus said to be saved? He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Mark 16, verse 16. And may every one of us be encouraged every day to try to be people after the heart of God who seek His will, who try to live holy lives, and who try to encourage others to follow in the pattern of Christ. May God help each of us as we strive to follow the heart of God each and every day. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.